Hello everyone. This week on We Talk Nerdy, I've got the tech news of the week and a review of the game Neverwinter. So stay tuned. We Talk Nerdy. WeTalkNerdy.tv is sponsored by UBU Enterprises, specializing in custom business website design, social media marketing, and online branding strategies for companies and products. Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of We Talk Nerdy. I'm your host, Dave Larson. Thanks for watching. So far this summer, I've moved, gone on vacation, mourned the loss of an old friend, and battled food poisoning. So I haven't put together any new shows, but I should be able to bring you the news pretty regularly for the rest of the summer, before I move again in the fall. <laughs> anyway, you're probably tired of hearing about the NSA's PRISM program, and you've no doubt heard of the plight of Edward Snowden, the man who blew the whistle on the NSA's PRISM. Uh, personally, I think he's done a good thing by bringing this program to light. Others would brand him a traitor. In either case, it's now become clear that the US government is monitoring all electronic communication, including email, voice chat, uh, credit card transactions, and cell phone conversations. Uh, not so much the cell phone conversation itself, but the metadata, uh, which is basically information about who called whom and for how long they spoke. Uh, they are storing this information for an unknown length of time in a massive $1.2 billion data center in Utah. No one is legally allowed to discuss the PRISM program, but I think well-known security expert Steve Gibson has most likely accurately described how the program works. In a nutshell, PRISM, uh, he thinks that it's called PRISM because the NSA is splitting off a portion of the light signal from the fiber, fiber optical cables of large companies like Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, and Google, just upstream of their connection to the internet. By doing it this way, they can capture all the data they need and they do not need the cooperation of any of those companies. Now, you may think it's okay for the government to collect all of this information about you. Um, you may say to yourself, I'm an honest citizen, I've got nothing to hide, and 62% of Americans agree with that. I think this kind of attitude is wrong-headed. Let's suppose for a moment that you support some unpopular notions like gay rights or the legalization of marijuana, uh, flat tax, the Illuminati, whatever. The government now can target you and make your life very difficult. This is what the FBI did without the PRISM program to Martin Luther King in the 1950s. According to Wikipedia, FBI agents investigated uh, Martin Luther King for possible communist ties, they recorded uh, information about his extramarital liaisons, and they reported on him to government officials. Uh, on one occasion, they even mailed him a threatening anonymous letter that he interpreted as an attempt to make him commit suicide. Technology like PRISM makes it possible to target anyone for any reason. Even if you're not doing anything wrong, it can be made to look as though you are. Uh, and I think it's just a matter of time before this program uh, will see some abuse. Um, if you want more information on this topic, I urge you to visit the Electronic Fun Frontier Foundation at EFF.org. And if you'd like to hear Steve Gibson's podcast, check out the show notes for links to his program. It's called Security Now on the Twit Network. Well, moving on. It looks like I was wrong. In episode 10, I predicted that Microsoft would make the Surface RT quietly go away and pretend like it never happened. Well, Microsoft isn't take, making the Surface RT go away, and they're certainly not being quiet about it. Microsoft recently wrote off a loss of $900 million, almost a billion dollars worth of Surface RT inventory. Microsoft has nearly a billion dollars worth of unsold Surface RTs just sitting in a warehouse somewhere gathering dust. Now, if you're not familiar with the Surface RT, it's a Windows 8 tablet with a dockable keyboard. The main problem with it, as far as I can see, is that it can't run regular Windows programs. It uses a, something called the ARM processor, and it's not compatible with regular Windows applications. 
In an effort to sell off their existing inventory of these tablets, Microsoft recently lowered the price of the Surface RT by $150, uh, from $499 down to $350. Question is, should you buy one? And the short answer, I think, is no. If you want to help Microsoft, go ahead. Um, otherwise, I would suggest you take a look at the new Nexus 7 tablet. Now, Google announced a new version of the Nexus 7 earlier this week, and I talked about the previous version of the Nexus 7 extensively in episode six of We Talk Nerdy TV. In case you missed it, the Nexus 7 is a um, seven inch Android tablet uh, made by Asus on behalf of Google. Uh, the Nexus, the new Nexus, Nexus 7 2013, if you will, is now officially, in my opinion, the best tablet on the market. The new Nexus 7 has a faster processor, both front and rear facing cameras, uh, a two megapixel front and five megapixel rear facing camera, uh, and a 323 uh, DPI resolution screen that runs at a full uh, 1080p HD resolution. Uh, if you paid top dollar for an Apple iPad mini, you paid too much for a good tablet because the new Nexus 7 goes on sale uh, this coming week for just $229 for the 16 gigabyte version uh, starting July 30th. If you're in the market for a tablet computer, this is the one to get. It's better and cheaper than the iPad mini and it's a much better choice than the Surface RT I was talking about before. And it's cheaper than that to boot. Speaking of Google, one of the stories I missed while I was on vacation was about Google's Project Loon. Essentially, Project Loon is an effort by Google to bring the power of the internet to the other two thirds of the world where it's currently unavailable. They've started a small pilot project in New Zealand using weather balloons to provide internet connectivity. According to Google, Project Loon balloons float in the stratosphere twice as high as airplanes and the weather. They are carried around the earth by winds and they can be steered by rising or descending to an altitude with winds moving in the desired direction. People can connect to the balloon network using a special internet antenna attached to a building. The signal bounces from balloon to balloon up in the stratosphere and then to the global internet back on earth. There's lots of additional information on google.com slash loon. Now, I've been accused of being a Google fanboy, and I happily confess that I am. Google's a company that's not afraid to try new things. Project Loon is kind of crazy and kind of awesome. I love that. If you don't, you don't see Microsoft or Apple doing that kind of thing, Google really is pushing the envelope. It, the more, yes, the more people who have internet access, the more money Google makes, so it's to their advantage. But to me, this is a just sort of a crazy out there, outside of the box kind of idea. And I really only see Google doing these kinds of things. And to me, even if it's not profitable for them or, or even if it, you know, it falls flat on its face, it's still a really cool use of technology. Um, and I love to see this kind of thing. By pushing the boundaries of what's possible, um, you know, Google is really, I think, inspiring people. Um, this is a zero carbon footprint project, and it could help a lot of people connect to the internet who currently can't. Uh, and I think that's a good thing. Speaking of news from Google, they announced another new product this past Wednesday called Chromecast. In a nutshell, Chromecast is the web on your TV. Best part about it is it's only $35. Um, and maybe this is a little bit of an oversimplification, but the Chromecast is a small dongle type device that attaches to your TV using what's called an HDMI connector. If you have a flat panel type TV that you've gotten in the, ra in the last maybe five years or so, you probably have an HDMI port on it. Chromecast then picks up wireless ethernet video signals and According to what I've uh, heard about it, you'll be able to transmit the content of a web page to the Chromecast and look at it on your TV. And this is going to work for um, uh, lots of different kinds of video content. You'll be able to watch YouTube, Netflix, you'll be able to listen to Pandora. And the Chromecast also promises to make it easier for content creators like myself. 
I should be able to provide a simple button on my website that will allow you to easily stream wetalknerdy.tv right on your TV. Um, and I'm really looking forward to that as soon as I can get my hands on one. Now, I tried to buy one, but unfortunately right now, Google and Amazon are both sold out, and the waiting time is about three to four weeks. Um, I've got mine on order, and hopefully I'll get it at some point in August, and I'll definitely do an episode on it as soon as I can. Now, I'd like to talk to you briefly about our sponsor, UBU Enterprises. Do you need a website for your small business? Maybe you need uh, help managing your business's social media. UBU Enterprises can help you. They've helped me personally a lot, and they took my ideas, they added their own flair for design and execution, and they helped me get my website exactly where I wanted it to be. I couldn't have done it without them. And the best part is they're still working with me to make sure that my website runs smoothly. You can visit them at ubuenterprises.com. Now, I'd like to review the game Neverwinter. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, Neverwinter is a so-called MMORPG, or in real-world terms, <laughs> massively multiplayer online role-playing game. It's published by Cryptic Studios, and it's based loosely on Dungeons & Dragons. Now, the 600-pound gorilla in the world of MMOs is Blizzard's World of Warcraft. You've probably heard of it. It's a huge international hit around the globe, and uh, it's dominated this type of game uh, since it was first released in 2004. Uh, a number of similar games have tried to find an audience, but it's very difficult because World of Warcraft is re very refined, very well po polished, and very, very dominant in this market. Uh, World of Warcraft is a subscription game. You pay a monthly fee in order to play. Neverwinter, on the other hand, has tried to build their audience by being a free-to-play game. Now, as you'll see in a moment, free-to-play does not necessarily mean free, but if you want to try Neverwinter, you definitely can. You just go to um, uh, http.nw.perfectworld.com, and installing the game is straightforward enough. You just click on the installer and begin the downloading process. Be prepared for a multi-hour download as the game files weigh in at about four gigabytes. Once you've completed the installation, you can create an account and your first character. And just like Dungeons and Dragons, there are several character types uh, available to you. There's two kinds of fighters. There's a wizard, a cleric, or a rogue. Uh, as you can uh, also, Sorry, you can choose several different races, including humans, elves, orcs, dwarves, and so on. If you've ever played D&D, you'll feel right at home with this game. Once you've created your character, you're ready to log on and play. Now, as I mentioned, Neverwinter is free to play. Uh, Neverwinter makes their money by selling you in-game merchandise and various kinds of upgrades. For example, you can create up to two different characters for free. If you want more, you'll need to buy additional character slots. At now, at first blush, this may seem like kind of a sleazy way for the game studio to make money. And I thought that that might be the case at first, but it doesn't really feel like it once you've started playing. Cryptic has done a very good job of making the game playable without you having to spend a dime. For example, I didn't spend any real money in the game until my character was level 25 or so. And even then, I didn't have to actually buy anything. I was enjoying the game well enough, and I wanted a fast horse, so I thought I would spend $20. I figured the game was worth at least that. For the you know, time that I'm playing it, I think $20 is a very fair price uh, for a game of this quality. And I was getting a lot of fun out of it, so I was okay with that. Now, you may be thinking that Neverwinter is setting itself up to be a place where players with more money just buy all the best stuff and poor players don't do as well. And that's only partially true. Yes, I suppose if you were ridiculously rich and you wanted to spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars, you could do exactly that. Uh, in Neverwinter, you can purchase things like uh, epic mounts, uh, epic companions, additional bank slots, uh, and additional character and companion slots. But for the most part, the best equipment for your character is earned through playing. You can buy really good equipment for cash money, but 
most people, as near as I can tell, are playing the game for the enjoyment of it to earn those things. They're not buying them outright. An Epic mount, for example, is about $20. If you're willing to spend several hundred, you could have a really tricked out character. And I could be wrong, but I just don't think it happens all that often. These are virtual goods after all, and I tend to think most people have a pretty low limit as to how much they're willing to spend. I think for the most part, people want to play the game and earn the items as opposed to just buying the best of everything. And if you did that, what would be the point in playing the game anyhow? So I guess the bottom line here is the game fun. Is the game fun? And I think so, yes. I, I think it's fair to say that the game is not as polished as World of Warcraft, but I also, also think it's fair to say that it's pretty much the same in a lot of ways. You create a character, you level him or her up by questing, you kill monsters and crawl through dungeons until you reach a level cap of 60. At level 60, you can get involved in epic dungeons for epic loot. And there's some differences between Warcraft as well. Uh, for example, the crafting system in Neverwinter is much more like EVE Online than it is World of Warcraft. The way it works is you hire minions, I'm calling them minions, <laughs> to craft items for you, and they go off and they make potions or armor on your behalf. Uh, unlike World of Warcraft, you don't have to run around and collect all the materials. On the flip side, it's harder to really uh, level your crafting faster. You could um, spend more cash money to buy the things you need in order to level, um, but you can also just take more time to earn them. And I, that's the way I'm doing it. Um, I don't want to spend hundreds of dollars on a game. Um, and to a certain degree, there are time limits to um, how it works. You can only uh, do things so quickly. For example, if you want to hire an additional mercenary, it takes about 18 hours for that to happen. You can speed up the process a little bit, but it still takes just about a, a half a day uh, in order to do it, no matter how much money you throw at it. So to a certain degree, crafting can only be leveled at a certain rate. An interesting feature of Neverwinter is all, the foundry. Aspiring dungeon masters can create their own dungeons and publish them for other people to play. I haven't jumped into this yet, uh, but this is really a great way for players to get involved in level design and for Neverwinter to get new free content. Um, it's really kind of a win-win situation and I was always kind of surprised that World of Warcraft didn't try something like this. Um, I've played a few of these Foundry dungeons and for the most part, they're pretty fun. The Foundry dungeons are, by design, a, a little bit more limited than the official maps, uh, but they're still pretty much worthwhile. The Foundry level designers are not allowed to choose what kind of loot is in the dungeon or how much you get. Um, that is strictly a function of the software. Uh, this, this way, dungeon masters can't create dungeons that are just full of loot with no monsters. Now, I've been playing Neverwinter for a few weeks now, and I like it, and as long as my friends are playing, I'm sure I'm going to stay around. Right now, we're having fun leveling our characters and killing monsters, but when we re reach level 60, who knows? But for a game that requires zero dollars to get started, it's definitely worth a try. Now, I don't have a how-to segment for this week, but I thought I'd like to give you a preview of what I'm working on for an upcoming show. The nerd in me decided that I wanted a health potion lamp. I saw something similar to this online, and I wanted to try it for myself. Now, many games incorporate the notion of health packs or health potions. The idea is that when you get shot or otherwise injured in a game, your health goes down, and health potions are used to restore that health. The convention here is that they're usually red and sometimes heart-shaped. So I managed to find some heart-shaped glass bottles from a seller on eBay. My idea is to fill these bottles with a red liquid that will glow when I place the, the bottle on a special base that I'm building. And I don't have all the parts together yet, but hopefully I'll have it ready for you soon. I'll show you the circuit design because I'm using a special circuit that makes the LEDs glow and pulse and I'll uh, show you how I made the special liquid that I'm going to put inside the bottles. Uh, I think it'll be pretty neat, so I hope you'll stay tuned for that. Well, that's it for this week. I hope you've enjoyed the show. 
Remember, if you have questions or problems and you need answers, visit us at wetalknerdy.tv uh, and leave a comment, or you can also send us an email at wetalknerdy.tv at gmail.com. Now, at the top of the show, I mentioned that a friend of mine died recently. I'd like to dedicate this show to the memory of my friend, Scott Pinkava. Uh, I first met Scott in the late 1990s. He was a staff animator at ABC and I was freelancing there. We hit it off pretty much right away and we worked together for many years. In fact, we worked together at no less than three different companies. We were both pretty nerdy and we shared a love of computers, movies, and video games. Scott used to host LAN parties at his house back in the day. We would all show up at his house on uh, Saturday morning and play Unreal Tournament or Quake or something like that uh, until sometime on Sunday. And we would shamble home with our eyes practically bleeding. Those were good times. Um, in 1998, Scott and I attended a computer graphics conference in Orlando called SIGGRAPH. At that show, we discovered a pretty cool game called San Francisco Rush. It was a really fun driving simulation game that featured some pretty amazing jumps and spectacular firing cr fiery crashes if you did something wrong, and we crashed a lot. <laughs> we played the heck out of that game uh, for the week that we were in Orlando, and weeks later, upon our return to New York, I discovered that the movie theater across the street where we were working in ABC uh, had San Francisco Rush in their lobby. And so from time to time, we used to go over on our lunch hour and we would play the game and not eat lunch. Uh, we usually had the place to ourselves, but one time we were there and a couple of kids were there playing our game. And uh, so we watched them play as we patiently waited for our turn. And uh, one of the kids took a turn the wrong way and drove his car right into the side of a building. Uh, his car exploded spectacularly across the screen, and his friend said, Dude, you're on fire! And he replied in a somewhat monotone expression, That's fat. For some reason, Scott picked up on that particular exchange, and from that point onward, if one of us did something particularly dumb, one of us would have to say, Dude, you're on fire! And inevitably, the reply was, That's fat. I left New York about three years ago, and neither one of us was uh, particularly good at keeping in touch. I spoke to him on the phone a little over a year ago, and times were kind of tough for both of us. Uh, Scott was a good guy, um, and he was hopeful and positive. Um, the last I spoke to him, I think he was looking forward to the future and definitely felt like things were going to improve for him. But uh, even though we had drifted apart in the recent years, I had always thought that maybe Scott and I would get a chance to hang out again, um, but that's not going to happen. I guess that's the thing about regret. It's not something you really ever get over. You just have to live with it. Thanks for listening. Dude, you're on fire. That's fat.